Division One is now in session. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Thank you. This is the time set for oral argument in ATR versus CEC. And Scott I Ayers? Ayers, thank you very much. Um, our cause number 1CACV150285. Let's go ahead and start with introductions of counsel. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Randy Nussbaum from the law firm of Nussbaum, Gillis, and Dinner. And my firm and I represent the appellants in this matter, CEC LLC and the individual members of the heirs. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is David Dick. I represent the plaintiff slash appellant, ATR. Great. Thank you both. Thank you both uh, here. Let me go through a few preliminaries. Each side has 20 minutes. If the appellant would like to reserve some time for rebuttal, when you go to the podium, if you'll let us know how much time you'd like to reserve, we'll try and make sure that we don't uh, um, cre creep into your rebuttal time as, or as little as possible. Let me advise uh, the parties we have reviewed the briefs. We have read pertinent portions of the record. The three of us have conferenced the case, so we're familiar with the issues and the arguments you have raised uh, on appeal. We are uh, recording the proceedings today, both audio and vi video, and in a few days the video will be up on our website and also you can review it on uh, YouTube. Because of that, when you go to the lectern, if you would please reintroduce yourself so if someone, however, listens to the audio version, they will be able to identify the speaker. And with that, let's go ahead and begin. Thank you. May it please the court, opposing counsel, my name again is Randy Nussbaum from the law firm of Nussbaum, Gillis and & Dinner, and my firm and I represent the appellants in this matter. I would like to reserve four minutes for rebuttal, please. Your Honors, there's two questions before the court. The first question involves whether a landlord breaches the covenant of good faith and fair dealing by requiring a new tenant as a condition of entering into a new lease to pay amounts that may have been owed by previous tenants. That's the first question. The second question is whether if the court finds that the LLC landlord violates the covenant of good faith and fair in dealing, are the individual members of the LLC then liable in the absence of any evidence of wrongdoing by the individuals on a personal level and in the absence of any evidence that the LLC entity uh, has been operated improperly? In this matter, my client, CEC, is simply a commercial landlord. The appellee, ATR LLC, was a subtenant that entered into a sublease in 2009. And at that time, my client, CEC, the landlord, did not sign off on that sublease. So you understand the parties, the heirs are the members of CEC. Chris Schwartz is a member of ETR. Now, at the time the sublease was entered into, at that point, the existing lease had an expiration date of May of 2013. Again, in 2009, ATR came in as a subtenant. In 2011, ATR decides to put the business on the market. Doesn't tell my client, the landlord, doesn't necessarily have to. ATR hires a business broker, Darren Hidsick, at that point. And that business broker starts looking for a buyer for the auto, it's an auto automotive repair business being operated at the premises. That's 2011. In 2012, about a year after the business was put on the market, Brian Fiore approaches the owner, ATR, and says to the owner, I'd like to buy your business. Now, something to remember, at no point up to that period, had ATR gone to my client, the landlord, and said, wait a minute, this lease expires in May of 2013. I need an extension. That was never discussed, never raised, and not part of this record. So what happens is, Brian Fury decides to buy the business, contacts the owner, and then contacts my client, CEC, 
and says to CEC, I'd like a new lease, no question. I'm not going to buy this business with only nine months left on this lease. So the parties start negotiating. There are three parties to the negotiation, Your Honors. There's Brian Fiore, who wants to buy the business and wants a new lease. There's CEC, the landlord, and this ATR, a subtenant. They go back and forth, and you've seen that in the record. In September and October, CEC believes it's owed money by both ATR and a previous tenant, and it tells both ATR and Mr. Fiore, as a condition of entering into a new lease, a brand new lease, I would like to be compensated because of amounts I've lost in the previous relationships. He's totally unabashed, and CEC is very clear about that. Finally, at the beginning of October of 2012, Chris Schwartz, on behalf of ATR, and Scott Ayers, on behalf of CEC, actually get together, and as the record shows, they have a conversation. Both parties by now are getting tired of all the exchanges, and Chris Schwartz says to Scott Ayers, if we agree, if, if I get you $8,000, will you then at that point agree to enter into a brand new re uh, lease with the buyer of my business? Scott Ayers says, okay, I'll do it. Now, it's true that Chris Schwartz at that point says, and I want to see back of Ford, but that's actually after they come to that understanding. The business broker is ecstatic. He's now going to get a commission, so he prepares a document, which is, again, in the record. And on October 18th, the document is presented, and Scott Ayers signs that document, and the document says, if you pay CEC $8,000, he will consent to a brand new lease on brand new terms with a new tenant. Everyone signs off. I know it's a little confusing, but I can tell you that Scott Ayers signs, the business broker signs, Brian Fiore agrees to it, he actually signs, I'm not quite sure it's in the record, but I think there's uh, part of the written, part of the uh, uh, trial confirmed that. Only one party at that point doesn't sign off. Even though Brian Fiore is ready to buy the business for an agreed upon amount, Chris Schwartz had previously told Scott Ayers they would pay the $8,000. At the 11th hour, ATR decides, wait a minute, we don't think we ever owed eight, uh, CEC any money. ATR never owed money. Those are not our problems. We're not going to pay that $4,000. At that point, Brian Fiore, the buyer, out of desperation comes in and says, I'll pay for the 8000 for my new lease but it doesn't matter. ATR refuses to pay, the deal dies, and as a result, we don't have a buyer for the business, and ATR ends up remaining in the premises till May of 2013 and then leaves. My client loses a buyer, and the broker loses a commission. But in the end, your honors, there's only one reason why this transaction did not close because a decision was made by ATR and by Fiore not to pay an amount that my client, the landlord, was requiring as a condition of a new lease. Now, a commercial landlord has an absolute right as a matter of law to request payment as part of a new lease. It's not a breach of the covenant of good faith and fair dealing to do so. This is a commercial transaction. There's no statute that prohibits it, which is not true with residential leases. If my landlord's not violating public policy, there's clearly no public policy issue here. And as long as my client is not acting inconsistent with the reasonable expectations of any of the parties to the contract, my client has the right to do so. And as you may know from personal experiences, all the time, landlords may put demands on new tenants based upon that landlord's past experience in leasing out the building. For example. Counsel, let me yes. ask you. Um, yes, your, sir. your arguments in your brief uh, focus exclusively on count five, the good faith fair dealing count. But as I read this record, both with the trial judge's decision, and we're here post-trial, as well as the judgment, 
It also found in favor of plaintiff on count six. Um, it appears that any challenge to that has been waived. Do we need to even address the good faith fair dealing issues that you're addressing, given that separate and independent basis for the judgment? Well, well Judge, I, the record, when the judge rendered his finding, uh, and we, it's in the, it's in the record, and right. we provide you with that, the judge specifically rendered his findings specifically on the breach of the covenant of, fair, of, of good faith and fair dealing. That's, that's one aspect of it, correct. But there's also, he found in favor of plaintiffs on count six. And Judge, I, I apologize. I believe that in looking at the ruling, um, I don't believe that that count um, is separate from the argument I'm advancing right now. Well, it's a tortious interference with a business expectancy, which has in its origin very different um, foundation and background than the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing that's a contractual concept. It's a tort. And Judge Thum, I understand that, except we specifically addressed um, if there is any confusion as to our appeal, we specifically address the very conduct you're referring to right now. The judge specifically found that the discussions between CEC and ATR in which CEC demanded certain monies, um, that's the conduct we're, we've referred to. And we're telling you that there was nothing improper. If Well, you're, you're saying it didn't breach the duty of good faith and fair dealing, which is the contract aspect of that. But I don't see your brief touching the tort aspect of that. Well, so it's the same. it's the same conduct, I understand that, but a very different legal theory that supports the judgment independently. But, but Judge, the argument we're advancing right now, and I understand your concern, if we show that the landlord, CEC, had the right to do what it did, then even though we may not have been articulate, the cause of action still fails on behalf of ATR, because the very gravamen of the argument is, did CEC engage in improper conduct, which would lead to either a tort or contractual finding. We have demonstrated that there was no wrongful conduct. For example, if my client had the right to charge the new tenant for uh, the new lease, how can there be any tort whatsoever that was violated, Your Honor? Let me ask you, though, because it seems to me that the court, the trial court relied on really four findings of, of conduct that it found was improper. Conditioning a willingness to assign the master lease by requiring ATR to, and I'm reading here, but um, yes. to assume repayment, uh, repayment obligations for a loan that heirs made to Rain. I'll call that the Rain alone because it's, yes. it's a little simpler. Uh, and ATR had no obligation, to my knowledge, to assume that. Um, and then to collect back rent under the master lease that CEC had waived its right to collect. Now, I understand there's a different point of view on that. That's a contractual issue, so sure. let me kind of set that aside. But then secondly, improperly claiming a lien on ATR's personal property or non-real property. And then three, threatening to evict ATR and then threatening to lock ATR out of the master lease property. So it's I understand your focus on the limit of what good faith fair dealing requires with respect to a new lease. Um, but it seems to me that those four issues that I'm, I get from the trial court's findings um, could support uh, conduct that was either tortious or lack of good faith fair dealing quite short of whether a new lease was executed. But Judge, here's the reason why in the end we don't believe it matters. There's a lot of conduct that took place in September, a lot of exchanges back and forth where CEC made demands, and you've, you've just described those. Um, all of that became superfluous. None of that resulted in Brian Fiore not buying the business. In other words, if the conduct you've just described triggered Mr. Fiore walking away, I fully understand the tort. But remember, Judge, on or about October 18th, reduced to writing was a document which eliminated all outstanding issues. That was a follow through to a meeting took place on, I believe, October 3rd, in which Mr. Schwartz agreed to pay the 8,000. So even if there had been conduct, it all at that point is rendered moot because 
there's an agreement, then you have a document prepared. So the only issue at that point on October 18th that was left was whether or not at that point my client, CEC, could demand that payment. The torturous conduct has all been become superfluous, all of that, because the fact that everyone agrees that by the middle of October there was a discussion, there was a document prepared, and my client specifically signed off on that document. So once again, I believe that our brief, the argument, is sufficient to address any potential torturous interference, especially because it's all tied into the conduct that became superfluous. And I understand your point on the fact that both claims, five and six, arise out of the same operative set of facts, but I read your brief quite differently. Um, and with respect to whether it was sort of superfluous, as you suggest, the contract that you described was never effectuated. The agreement, it came close, it came really close to getting resolved. Um, but there was no claim, at least, and I've read every word of the trial testimony, there was no claim that that contract was binding on all parties. Now, help me if I've misrecalled that. Well, interestingly enough, um, we argued that the handshake agreement would be sufficient in the absence of any testimony to the contrary. Um, having said that, we acknowledge that in the end, my client put a condition on the new lease of the $8,000 payment. We did not, uh, at one point we did file a claim for rent, we dropped it, we did not file any affirmative action. We're not asking anyone to do anything affirmatively as to my client. We're only talking about one series of events, a series of events regarding the decision to charge an amount which we believe our client had an absolute right to charge. And if it wasn't for that, if it wasn't for the fact we got to that point, I fully understand the argument that all of that old activity may have hampered the transaction with Fiore. But Brian Fiore, the buyer, the one that was going to pay ATR the money, the record surely, clearly showed he didn't care about any of that. In the end, it came down to there were two things that were required by Mr. Fiore. He wanted to have a new lease, and he personally at the end said, I'm not going to pay it. I'll pay only 4,000 of it. Interestingly enough, if you look even at the Appleby's brief, the issue you've just raised has not been even discussed because everyone operated under the impression that this case all revolved around whether the conduct that we've just covered, whether that conduct constituted a breach of the covenant of good faith and fair dealing. Well, and I understand that, and I, I, I const and focusing again just on count five because I don't yeah. think your your brief addresses count six. But it seems to me good faith fair dealing requires really three things. There has to be a duty arising yes. out of contract, and your brief has a heading suggesting you're challenging that, but I don't really see you challenging that mm -hmm. your client owed a duty of good faith fair dealing. Whether that duty was breached. And you address that head on, no question. And then resulting damages. And I don't see you addressing that either. It really, it seems to me that you're focusing on, was there a breach here? Is that fair? Yes. And from that perspective, um, I understand your arguments and I want to hear more from you on that. But I continue to, to struggle with the thought that this judgment is supported by two counts, one of which appears is clearly challenged on appeal in that respect and the other of which just doesn't seem that it is. Okay, and, and I will address that then during rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, my name is David Dick. I represent the plaintiff, ATR, um, who is a basically a one-man mom-and-pop shop that does auto repair about two blocks from my house. They have been friends with me and worked on, I'm guessing, at least 17 of, of my old cars. Um, I know Chris Schwartz personally, and I'm here to try to explain the history of this case, which is a little more complex than the defendant is letting you understand. Scott Ayers has multiple businesses. He has a business called CEC, which is the defendant in this case. 
He also has a business called DDASVS. Um, if you go to the Exhibit 70, you'll see the loan agreement that... That was the rain, rain alone, right? Correct. And that's with Mr. Reina. It's not even with New Millennium. And the importance of this is this, because when they started the original contract, Master Lease, which is Exhibit 3 and 152, it was dated originally 5-8, then 5-14, and then 5-16. And that's apparently because Mr. Reina didn't have enough money to start the business. So... Mr. Ayers goes to him and says, I'll loan you $5,000 or, excuse me, $6,848, um, which he does, and then basically doesn't do anything about it between 2009 and September of 2012. I shouldn't say that. I should say that when September of 2000, excuse me, between 2008 and 2009, when my client buys the assets of New Millennium in late 2009, you'll be able to look at Exhibit 117. 117 is an a email from Mr. Ayers to Mr. Reyna saying, I'm not going to sign the sublease unless you pay me my $6,800. Mr. Reyna didn't respond. Mr. Reyna had made a payment on the loan. It might have been the, the reason he didn't uh, respond, but the point that Mr. Ayers did, he just let that sit there. He didn't say at any time, I have a UCC lien, which he did not. He did not say, I borrowed you $6,000 and file a UCC lien on New Millennium. New Millennium didn't get the money. Mr. Reyna did. What happened next was is that Mr. Ayers then apparently get, he gets a, an email correspondence from my client, Chris Schwartz, Exhibit 63. And it basically says, hi, I'm the new lessee of this end suite. Mr. Ayers has a paint shop on one end. My client has two bays as uh, automotive repair. Scott, Mr. Schwartz on Exhibit 63 says, Hi, I'm Scott. I, I'm Chris. If you, you need anything to hit me to sign anything, give it to me. I'm going to be paying the rent. And he pays the rent each and every month from November of 2009 all the way through September of 2012. No problems. Nothing ever said that Exhibit 11 applies. And, he, and Exhibit 11 is called, I call it the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding. Basically what it says is that we're not going to use the terms in the master lease. We're going to change them a little bit and make your payment higher at the first and then change it on down the lease. Well, that's never sent to my client by Mr. Reyna and we have my client's purchase agreement, Exhibit 7, and the other documents that show he never got that. Now, Mr. Ayers basically doesn't say anything about the memorandum of understanding until my client finds a buyer. Now, I, I, it's really important for me to, for you to understand one point. When Mr. New Millennium had the, the two bays, they were making maybe ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 a month. My client, Chris Schwartz, goes out. He does advertising in grocery stores. He does advertising in the local community. And he builds his business from 14000 to about 30000 a month a very lucrative business. And he then uh, hires the real estate, uh, the business sales agent, who finds the buyer from the state of Washington. The buyer comes down and says, hey, I like this. I'll buy it for 80000 Now, what's really important is th you have to understand that my client, Quit Schwartz, kind of felt like the ducks at one of these carnival uh, shows. You hit one duck and it turns over and another duck shows up. Mr. Ayers first sent him uh, Exhibit 12, which says, I'm not going to sign a new lease with Mr. Fiore unless you pay $6,800 plus interest. Didn't he have a right to do that? No, Your Honor, because the, the, the debt that was owed, that 6800 was never done as a UCC. I understand that, but the, and just focusing on count five, because I want to hear your perspective on what, whether count six is properly before us or not, but the duty of good faith and fair dealing doesn't require a party to enter into a new contract, does it? Correct, but the, but the wagon seller case is important on this. You can't do something for a reason that violates public policy. Public policy says if you're going to buy an asset, and somebody's going to make a claim for a lien, they have to do a UCC filing so the good faith buyer, good faith purchaser for value knows about it. And Mr. Schwartz did the UCC search, nothing there. And Mr. Ayers then says, no, I get to bring up this loan 
And, and the part that I want the court to understand about bad faith is he didn't bring up the loan and say, I am owed $5,800 because of the, at least the one payment I could find. He says, I'm owed $6,800 plus 4000 in interest. And the point that, that I'm getting at here is that Mr. Ayers he knew he had no right to say to Chris, you must pay my loan. Now, if he would have said to Chris, hey, I won't sign a new lease unless you give me a certain amount of money, we would have been in an entirely different situation. But isn't there testimony at, from the trial that that was his approach, that this $8,000 was just a number he sort of pulled up? No, I'm not right. saying the finder of fact was required to believe that, but isn't that what he testified? Um, Mr. Ayers did eventually land on that third duck and claim that that was the reason he wasn't agreeing to the new lease. But in the meantime, and all of you look at all of his emails, it's disproven by those emails. There's a, two pages in my brief that say that the $8,000 agreement was done on approximately, was discussed, let me make sure I get the time dates. Mr. Ayers make the first claim for other amounts on September 10th. September 10th through October 17th, my client says, prove to me I owe you that money. And they go through the different variations loan, rent, and then new lease. Um, and the new lease wasn't even brought up at that point. It was kind of implied. Mr. Schwartz says, well, would you take $8,000 and sign the new lease? And, and, and Mr. Ayers says, yeah, sure I will. And then Chris says, well, prove to me that you, I'm owe, I owe you the 8000 either by rent or by any other document. When Mr. Reyna does not do that, excuse me, Mr. Ayers does not do that, my client says, no, I won't pay additional money to give you about 21% of the sales price. Because you have to remember, the business and is I selling for 80. There's, there's a net net in there. And, and I, I know that, that number from the filings, or at least know of that concept. But it, it, didn't Mr. Fiore make it pretty plain, pretty consistently, that his willingness to buy the assets from your client was conditioned on getting a new lease? No, he actually said four things. Number one, he wanted a release from Scott Ayers that he would not have any claim on any of the assets. And you've got to remember that when, new, when ATR bought the place, there was Exhibit 17, a very minimal list of assets. My client added two more lists I, and other I understand. things. And specifically, Mr. Fiore, in his last letter on October 21st, said, in order for me to buy, I need three things. I need Scott Ayers to say he doesn't have a lien on your property. I need Scott Ayers to um, specifically say that you don't owe past rent. And then I need a lease from Scott Ayers. There was three things there. And two of those were just claims that had no basis for Mr. Ayers to make those. And again, though, with respect to, you know, and perhaps I'm slipping into the resulting damages, which you've heard me say I'm, I don't think is in front of us, but, um, you know, if all of this was contingent on the parties entering into a new lease with res from Mr. Fiore's perspective, and if the landlord had no good faith fair dealing to uh, obligation to enter into a new lease, how, how has there been an actual breach of that obligation been shown? Two parts to that. Mr. Fiore was not tied to that location. If you look at the email, specifically um, Exhibit 25, I believe, new lease, Exhibit 25, you'll see in there that he basically says, your location, Mr. Ayers, is not desirable for me because it's so small. And there was massive amount of discussion between Mr between ATR, Chris Schwartz, and Mr. Fiore, that there were four other locations nearby that he could rent and, and use as a location. But the problem was, at that point, Mr. Fiore was so worried that he was going to get sued by Mr. Ayers for the loan, for the, the, the lien on the property, and for the back rent if he took over the assets of ATR. Mr. Fiore said no. Mr. Fiore, his specific statement was, I believe that Scott Ayers was basically taking or trying to take 10 to 20 percent of the of the amount of the sale for himself, and that was the only thing he was doing. Um, and clearly, that you have to understand that Mr. Ayers signed basically an email accepting Mr. Fury's terms of the new lease on October 6th. That's Exhibit 25, um, and because of that, he at that point didn't have a reason to come back and say, okay, now, Chris, I'm not going to sign the new lease unless you take over the loan 
of Mr. Reyna, unless you take over this new claim of back rent that the judge specifically found had not had been waived, and that's what's so important. The claim for back rent was eleven thousand, of which six thousand eight hundred dollars was all late charges because Mr. Ayers did not once send a notice to to Mr. Schwartz saying you're late for the last two years. Let, let me, uh, if I may, forgive me for interrupting you, but I want to make sure I have a. You know, we're, we're not sitting as a finder of fact. We're not a jury. Um, we look at more of the legal issues, but I do want to make sure I understand because first, there was no obligation. Mr. Ayers or the correct, company, Mr. Ayers. CEC, had no obligation whatsoever to enter into a new lease. That's, we know that. He's not required to do that. So what I hear you saying is that be, because of these other three issues, um, the lien issues, the past due rent, and plus the paying off of the debt, the Rainer, Rainer debt. Right, Rainer. Oh, okay, that debt. Even though he was not in, he had no duty to, or obligation to enter into a new lease, by demanding those those three items, um, he was uh, basically in the context of the inter tortious interference claim. He was interfering with a prospective business advantage, not because he wasn't going to uh, enter into Tunis, but he was trying to demand or to exert some leverage on these other three items. Correct. And on Exhibit 52 is exactly that. I'm sorry, what was that? Exhibit 52. Okay. It's got pages 143 through 146. And specifically what Mr. Ayers says, I have the following options to the buyer, my client's buyer, Mr. Fiore. I can start, I can accept a medical marijuana tenant immediately. I can, uh, Chris can sell you the business and pay his bill with me. Chris can make payment of 13000 and finish out the lease. Or Chris leaves and you and I make some sort of deal. Or Chris leaves and the former employees, they've all contacted me, make some sort of a deal. Or six, I take over ATR. What he did and what his intention was either one of the last two. He was going to sell ATR to the buyer. And the emails that we have say that. He says, I own everything. I'll just evict Chris and I will sell it to you. You don't need Chris. And, and this goes on to say, you no, know, the one last one, the one that he actually ended up doing, he basically refused to renew the lease, which there is terms within the master lease exhibit three that says you have to enter into good faith negotiations about renewal. He didn't do that. He just flat out refused and took over ATR. And he's operated it for the last two years. Um, the point I'm getting at, his bad faith and his tortious interference is clearly stated in Exhibit 52 at CAC uh, 141 through 146. And that, I think, gives the court um, substantial evidence to do what it did. And I agree with what you've been saying. The court said you've done two things. You violated your duty of good faith and you did tortiously interfere with the sale. And I want to bring up one other point. CEC had no business interest in enforcing the loan of DDASAV or whatever it was. Um, but that was the sticking point in this whole deal. And when they start talking about Scott Ayers' personal liability, he went, and if you look at all his emails, almost all of them are signed Scott. They're not signed CAC. They're not signed manager of CAC. They're simply signed by Mr. Ayers. And Mr. Ayers in his letters, uses the pronoun I. I can sell you this. Counsel, let me ask you, uh, before we dive deep into that, and I want to, um, what is your perspective on whether uh, the substance of count six is before this court or whether that's been waived? No, Your Honor, I don't think it's been waived at all. The tortious interference was, was specifically pled. You might remember there Counsel, was a... just so you understand my question, I understand it's an aspect of the judgment. The question is whether that's been waived on appeal or not. Your Honor, I didn't see a single argument in the defendant's brief that went to that. He has been relying solely on there isn't a duty of good faith that was breached and there's no personal li liability of Mr. Ayers and his wife. And let me, given that, turn back to five with respect to personal liability. 
Um, it seems to me, and I understand you're pointing out the use of personal pronouns, but um, to cut through from a contractual perspective to the individual members, wouldn't you have to show um, a fair bit more than what you did? If there was only the issue of, and again, I, this because it wasn't raised specifically, the court heard that Mr. Ayers went far beyond just the letters in the sale. He went well beyond to harass Mr. Schwartz from September through the end of the lease. And I understand your point of view with res if count six is in front of us, but with respect to count five, the contract um, dispute, it would seem to me that you would have had to literally pierce the veil of the LLC, and I don't see that the you know the the li liquidity issues you know it's a it's a pretty large factual undertaking and I just don't see that in the record oh yeah I don't think that again we were attempting to pierce the corporate veil we were attempting to show that mr. Ayers took specific action to harass the employees and customers and everybody that came to ATR and that was his personal action that violated the duty of good faith how to his did, business. How did he owe plaintiff, in, how did Mr. Ayers individually owe plaintiff a contractual implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing? I don't think there's any argument there's anything close to contractual privity there. And if it is indeed a product of contract, you have to have a contract of which he is a party. I agree that there is no specific contract However, if Mr. Ayers is got the second contract, the DDSY or ASAV contract, and he takes action to harass the, my client because of that, it, it may not be privity of contract, but clearly he's taking action because of that contract and in addition and because of the original lease contract. Doesn't doesn't the duty of good faith, fair dealing, when it's applicable, though, allow one party to a contract to seek relief from another party to that contract, not to a stranger? Usually, Your Honor, but again, if, that, if the original contract is being used to apply actions that are meant to destroy the business, and in this case, you have to remember, Mr. Ayers not only refused to let the sale go through, he refused to renew the lease in May of 2013. And my client was operating. Did he have the right to renew it? It wasn't his property. No, Your Honor. In, in Exhibit One, excuse me, Three and One Fifty Two, there is a provision that the Judge uh, Telemonte brought up that basically says the party shall re-engage in good faith negotiations to renew the lease, and Mr. Ayers wouldn't respond to anything. And I understand that, but it's not his property. It's it's CEC's property. Correct. It is CAC, it's CAC's business, um, and Mr. Ayers is the, is the person that was operating. The violation of duty of good faith is, is going to the buyer and also making statements that are false, that, that Chris doesn't have a computer list, that Chris doesn't own these assets, that Chris you know, doesn't do that much business. And those are all directly Mr. Ayers, and nothing that in CAC's interest was to prevent the sale. That was solely by Mr. Ayers. And I see my time is up. Well, feel free to take 48 seconds, and if you'd like to have a sentence or two to wrap up. Your Honor, you know, landlords have a lot of discretion. And this case really, I think, is important to say to landlords, you know, if you want to have a business sense, for a new lease, that's fine. But you have to remember that the, the documents submitted show that Chris could have rented the entire building at, I think, 7 or $14 per square foot. Mr. Ayers entered into a lease with Mr. Fiore for 21 There was a fair market value exchange that Mr. Ayers entered into with the new buyer, but then he tried to get money on top of it that was nothing more than extortion. He knew that if he put his foot down, this sale would die. And he put his foot down, not for a legitimate reason, because he had proved the buyer. That's what Exhibit 25 says. Instead, what he did is say, give me 20% of the sale or I'm going to kill it. And he did exactly that. Your Honors, 
When the court rendered its ruling, the court relied upon what I call the tortious interference claim on the verbiage that that my client interfered with plaintiff's business expectations by preventing the sale from plaintiff to Brian Fiore. We focused extensively on that argument. We talked in our pleading, we talked about was there any type of interference with business relationship? Did we do anything to prevent the sale? So again, I will, um, you have piqued my interest. Afterwards, I'll go home and take a look at uh, what you're telling me now. But I will tell you that that's what the Judge Talamante said, Mr. Nussbaum, CEC interfered with ATR's business expectations. That was a torturous interference. Our brief is replete with an explanation about how there was no interference and there was no interference with any business uh, expectations in this case. And that's because? Pardon? And that is because? Because three reasons. First of all, the activity that was alleged had been, it became irrelevant once the parties reached an understanding and it became clear Mr. Mr. Ayers and CEC didn't care about any of that. And this whole idea that he was being articulate in what he wanted, in the end, he finally threw up his arms and said, CEC will take eight grand, I don't care what it's for. Number two, tied into that is the fact that we can't understand what the tortious interference was because all we did, we did nothing to block that sale. Think about the record, Your Honor. We didn't go to Fiore and say, don't buy the business. Quite to the contrary, we negotiated extensively with Mr. Fiore specifically so there'd be a new lease. How can that be evidence of an interference with a business expectation? What we don't understand, and I can leave you with this, what exactly was ATR's business expectation that supposedly was breached? What exactly was ATR asking us to have done and what was it expecting? You've heard argument that because we had negotiated and we're negotiating a good lease with Fiore, that should have been sufficient. But what was the business expectation of a tenant which had a lease that was expiring in a matter of months? Let me, let okay. me ask about this. Um, okay. I understand the point about no duty for the lease and all of that, but the trial judge found that uh, your client had threatened eviction action and threatened to lock out, uh, lock, lock ATR out, and also had claimed a lien on the property. Now, focusing on that, the, those findings, Mr. Fiore was go going to be buying an ongoing business. It's true he wanted a, a, a lease, but he's buying an, an established, ongoing operating business. Therefore, these these things, although they might not have affected the entry of a new lease, they would have interrupted the ongoing business operations of ATR that this man wanted to acquire. Therefore, they had an effect, and why wouldn't that be enough to then to, to tortiously interfere? Here's why, Judge Norris. Yeah. Because if you look at what's before the court, you'll see Mr. Fiore's comments at the end of October, October 20th, saying, I want to go forward. He was, read, there's, there's an email exchange on the 19th and 20th in which he said, I want to go forward. My family's coming down. Uh, I'm excited. This is my first business. Does that sound like an individual who's now nervous about buying the business, Judge Norris? Think about that. Take a look at the exchange on the 18th, 19th, and 20th, where, and then look at his testimony. Why did he throw up his arms in the end? He threw up his arms because he couldn't get the lease. He wanted that new lease, and he was frustrated. This is a tragic case for a lot of reasons, but to suggest that anything that occurred impacted on Mr. Fiore, there's nothing in the record. Quite to the contrary, this guy went to Herculean lanes to keep the deal alive. He wanted it so badly. He was so excited. Um, he was ready to close on October 20th, 21st, 22nd, 23rd. He wanted to go. How is that evidence of any torturous interference whatsoever? Now, let me leave you. If Mr. Fury, by the middle of October, had said, I'm not touching this business because of all these other issues, but the record shows the exact opposite. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank, Thank you, Your you. Honors. Thank you. Thank you both for your arguments and your briefing on appeal. We'll take this matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. Thank you.